The Battle of Shiloh in southwestern Tennessee, April 6th and 7th, 1862, was very nearly a Union defeat. Grant had developed a reputation for focusing more on his own plans than on the enemy's actions. This contributed to significant losses on April 6th when his men were encamped at Pittsburgh Landing along the Tennessee River. Grant was criticized later for failing to have his men prepare adequate fortifications at Shiloh. He responded in his memoirs. Up to that time, the pick and spade had been but little resorted to at the West. Besides this, the troops with me, officers and men, needed discipline and drill more than they did experiences with the pick, shovel, and ax. Reinforcements were arriving almost daily, composed of troops that had been hastily thrown together into companies and regiments, fragments of incomplete organizations, the men and officers, strangers to each other. Under all these circumstances, I concluded that the drill and discipline were worth more than our under all of these circumstances, I concluded that the drill and discipline were worth more to our men than fortifications. Nonetheless, the lack of fortifications made it all the easier for Albert Sidney Johnston and P.T. Beauregard to strike the Union troops in a bloody surprise attack. Grant, nursing an ankle that had been badly injured when his horse had fallen days earlier, had not expected an attack and was miles away in Savannah. While I was at breakfast, heavy firing was heard in the direction of Pittsburgh Landing, and I hastened there. On reaching the front, about 8 a.m., I found that the attack on Pittsburgh was unmistakable. Captain Baxter, a quartermaster on my staff, was accordingly directed to go back and order General Wallace to march immediately to Pittsburgh by the road nearest the river. Miscommunications resulted in General Lew Wallace not arriving where and when Grant needed him, and Wallace's troops would not take part in the first day of fighting. The Battle of Shiloh took its name from what Grant called a log meeting house, two to three miles from the Pittsburgh Landing. This point was the key to our position and was held by Sherman. His division was at that time wholly raw, no part of it ever having been in an engagement. But I thought this deficiency was more than made up by the superiority of the commander. Grant's faith in General William Tecumseh Sherman was complete and would remain so throughout the war. In the Battle of Shiloh, Sherman proved himself deserving of Grant's trust. Grant described the first day of battle. During the whole of Sunday, I was continuously engaged in passing from one part of the field to another, giving directions to division commanders. And thus moving along the lines, however, I never deemed it important to stay long with Sherman. A casualty to Sherman that would have taken him from the field that day would have been a sad one for the troops engaged at Shiloh and how near we came to this. On the 6th, Sherman was shot twice, once in the hand, once in the shoulder, the ball cutting through his coat and making a slight wound, and a third ball passing through his hat. In addition to this, he had several horses shot during the day. The Confederate assaults were made with such a disregard of losses on their own side that our line of tents soon fell into their hands. The ground on which the battle was fought was undulating, heavily timbered with scattered clearings, the woods giving some protection to the troops on both sides. A number of attempts were made by the enemy to turn our right flank, where Sherman was posted, but every effort was repulsed with heavy loss. But the front attack was kept up so vigorously that, to prevent the success of these attempts to get to our flanks, the national troops were compelled, several times, to take positions to the rear near Pittsburgh Landing. When the firing ceased at night, the national line was all of a mile in rear of the position it had occupied in the morning. Both sides had taken shockingly high casualties, the highest seen in the war to that point. The Confederates had indeed lost over 8,000 men that first day. 
Among them was the commander of the Confederate forces. With Johnston's death, General P.T. Beauregard took command. Beauregard sent a telegram that night to President Jefferson Davis. It read, a complete victory. Unfortunately for him, his assessment was premature. Many later criticized Beauregard for calling a halt to the attack at dusk, feeling that if he had continued to push, then perhaps a complete victory would have been possible. But his men were exhausted, and there was less than an hour of daylight remaining, and Beauregard did not know what was happening in the Union camp. Grant's forces had been reinforced by 15,000 men in Major General Don Carlos Buell's army and General Lew Wallace's division of 5,000 men were also fresh troops, having not seen major fighting on the first day. With these additional Union forces and the loss of troops on the Confederate side, Beauregard would find himself outnumbered on April 7th, when Grant and Buell counterattacked. Shiloh was a Union victory, but a terribly costly one. Union forces lost over 1,750 killed, 8,400 wounded, and almost 3,000 captured or missing. The numbers on the Confederate side were similar, except for a much smaller number captured or missing. The willingness of the Confederate Army to take such losses worked to change Grant's understanding of how victory could be accomplished. I saw an open field in our possession on the second day, of which the Confederates had made repeated charges the day before, so covered with dead that it would have been possible to walk across the clearing in any direction, stepping on dead bodies without a foot touching the ground. Up to the Battle of Shiloh, I, as well as thousands of other citizens, believed that the rebellion against the government would collapse suddenly and soon if a decisive victory could be gained over any of its armies. Donaldson and Henry were such victories. Up to that time, it had been the policy of our army, certainly of that portion commanded by me, to protect the property of the citizens whose territory was invaded, without regard to their sentiments, whether union or secession. After this, however, I regarded it as humane to both sides to protect the persons of those found at their homes, but to consume everything that could be used to support or supply armies. Grant took a lot of heat in the North for the Union losses. There were false reports of him being drunk and criticisms of his lack of fortifications. Some wanted him removed from command, to which Lincoln replied famously, I can't spare this man. He fights. This in contrast to his premier general in the East, George McClellan. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.